Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. My name is Evan. And I'm Jonathan. And you are listening to the Tackling Basketball Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. We have a very busy agenda as usual today, of course, going through our goat and dick of the week. Have some pretty big trade stuff going on right now, especially in the NFL. And oh, yeah. then NFL draft coming up on Thursday, so we're going to give you our mock first half of the first round of top 16 picks. So a lot to get through, but let's, of course, start out with Goat and Dick of the Week. Jonathan, who is your goat of this week? You know, my goat for this week is Bubble... Uh, no, uh, <laughs> Jamal Murray. <laughs> um, playoff Murray, if you will. Uh, there was this thing that he did a couple of years ago, I'm sure you've all heard of it, um, that sort of gave him the nickname of Bubble Murray. Um, and ever since then, he's been sort of working to overcome it because what started as a sort of positive uh, moniker for him has sort of devolved into a lot of slander. Well, Murray's only this good in the bubble. But uh, he proved in game two with a 40-point performance in just his second playoff game back from injury that he is not bubble Murray he is playoff Murray, and he will come to play every night. So, pretty fantastic showing from him, and all of Nuggets Nation is excited to uh, see him continue to show out in the playoffs. Yeah, absolutely. And then on my side, for my GOAT, um, I put Jalen Brunson, and honestly, I could just as easily put New York Knicks fans. Oh, yeah. Um, Jalen Brunson has been showing out. Um, He has been absolutely, over this postseason so far, been living up to the contract that the Knicks gave him um, when, over the offseason, a lot of people said that they probably overpaid for him, and they Mm -hmm. likely they still probably did. But so far in this postseason, he's been leading the charge for the New York Knicks. They're up 3-1 on the Cavs. They're sitting pretty. And then on the Knicks Knicks fan side of things... I mean, they haven't had something like this to be excited about in, what, a decade? Yeah. So New York is going crazy. If the Knicks wind up making it to the Eastern Conference Finals, which I'm I'm not thinking they will, (laughs) but if they make it that far, I think the south side of Manhattan, where Madison Square Garden is, might burn to the ground. (laughs) Knicks fans are going ballistic, and honestly, I love it. I mean, here's the crazy thing about Brunson is the Knicks probably did overpay, but they also were so right to do so. And especially Dallas fans right now are just hurting so badly uh, watching his success while they are on the outside of the playoffs looking in, having given up on uh, signing Brunson to their own long-term deal. Yeah, so. absolutely. <laughs> but enough of the positivity over here. Who is now your dick of the week? My dick of the week is, sadly for me, uh, the St. Louis Battlehawks. <laughs> um, this is XFL. I'm sorry if you don't care. But um, in the first year of the third rendition of the XFL, the St. Louis Battlehawks mm-hmm. went 7-3 and three for a 700 overall record and missed out on playoffs by the fifth tiebreaker and meanwhile, in the other division, a team that had a 400 record with only four wins made the playoffs. So it, it, I looked up some statistics on this uh, heading into the episode and uh, just to sort of gauge how common it was for a team that was 700 to miss the playoffs in other leagues. Um, in the NBA, throughout all of history, the best record to ever miss the playoffs was the 53-54 Knicks with a 44-28 and record, good for 6-11. Um, the best team in the Super Bowl era was the 76 Bengals at 10-4 and um, with a 7-14 record, actually outpacing the St. Louis Battlehawks. But the best team um, in a 16-game season for the NFL was the 85 Broncos at 11-5 and to miss the playoffs with a 687 record. Um, so the St. Louis Battle, Battle Hawks are one of the best records in the history of American sports to miss the playoffs, and they're doing so in a year that a really, really bad team also made it. So, I mean, if I got my preference, I would just say the XFL needs to do away with the second place in both division makes the playoffs and rather have two wild card teams. But 
the the Battle Hawks fans had a really rough weekend <laughs> this week. <laughs> Sucks for the Battle Hawks. Uh, my dick this week um, is Dylan Brooks, and Dylan mm-hmm. Brooks, uh, similar to our situation with Dan Snyder. Uh, we made a rule. We can only put him in once because otherwise he'd be in here all the time. But especially after this weekend, Dylan Brooks, um, for those who don't know he, who he is, he is a player for the Memphis Grizzlies. He has made himself into the quote-unquote villain of the NBA, but he's really not because he just talks a massive amount of crap and acts tough, but no one really buys it and no one really sees him as a villain. He just likes to make himself out to be a villain. Um, he went into the game against the Lakers – essentially calling LeBron James old, um, <laughs> saying that LeBron isn't that good, saying that he doesn't he doesn't believe that LeBron is that good until LeBron can put up 30 points against him. And what did LeBron James do? He got Dylan Brooks ejected in the first half of the game. Yep. <laughs> so uh, Dylan Brooks just looks like a m- major idiot. Um, Grizzlies go down. I believe Lakers now leave either 2-1 or 3-1. And, yeah, Brooks is... Moron. <laughs> <laughs> Without a doubt. But transitioning from that, uh, we alluded to some trade situations going on in the NFL right now. Just this morning, um, probably the biggest trade that we are going to have this offseason in the NFL. Aaron Rodgers being traded from the Packers to the Jets. The Jets receiving Aaron Rodgers and then the Packers 15th overall in this draft, as well as a fifth round pick in this year's draft. Packers getting the Jets 13th, so they essentially swap first round picks. Right. Uh, the Jets second round pick this year, which is the 42nd pick in the draft, I believe a six round pick. And then they get a second for next year that if Aaron Rodgers plays a certain amount, can become a first-round pick. 65% of snaps, I yeah, believe. which uh, with Aaron Rodgers' history of play time, he should be able to hit that. Yeah. So um, I am the Packers fan. I can go second. Jonathan, your initial reaction <laughs> to this trade. You know, um, I, I expected there to be some conditions attached to the trade, um, but... I did not expect those conditions to be for this year because I do not think personally that the Jets are uh, super well equipped to find immediate deep playoff success right now, even with Aaron Rodgers. So I expected this deal to be contingent upon Aaron Rodgers being rostered in 2024 rather than the amount of snaps he played in 2023. Um, So just that fact alone that this first round pick will almost certainly vest for the Packers is huge. I, I probably had it um, valued at around two seconds, two Jets value seconds, early seconds, and uh, knowing that it will more than likely be a second and a first and a, a couple picks upgraded in this draft um, is, I think, a really positive deal for the Packers. And you can talk yourself into it as a Jets fan as well. It gives you an option for immediate success and um at the end of the day uh you hope to be giving up a late first round pick uh in next year's draft so it shouldn't hurt you too badly yeah absolutely and i totally agree as a packers fan i really couldn't be happier i mean like we were talking about earlier i would be delusional to expect the Packers to have gotten any more out of an Aaron Rodgers trade than this. And this is more than I was expecting. And yeah. especially after he appeared on the Pat McAfee show where he said that like going into his darkness retreat, that he was like 95% <laughs> retired. At that point, my mind was like, okay, if we can now trade him, like anything we get is a win. Because at that point, it's he retires or you trade him and get something. So like that, my mind was set on like, if we can get anything for him, Obviously, we want to get fair value, but if we can get anything for him, it'll be good for the Packers. But now we get upgraded a couple spots in this year's draft, which, sure, we're going from 15 to 13. But when you look at most mock drafts and what team needs, it really shouldn't be much of a difference. So it's kind of a wash there. But then getting the um, the 10th pick in the second round this year is huge. Getting a more than likely a first next year very big so way to go Gutenkutz and the Packers um, and yeah. now it is 
Jordan loves time to put up or shut up in Green Bay. Yeah, and like like I said, uh, I probably would have preferred to see a conditional pick that was conditional on next year's status rather than this year. But even as it stands, I think that Jets fans have something to celebrate as well. Um, they are actually making this trade happen in a reasonable period of time. They are able to look forward to having good quarterback pay, back play for the first time in a very long time. Um, and it, they will have some exciting football this season, if nothing less. So I, I think it's a good trade on both sides. I think it slightly favors the Packers, but nothing to complain about from the Jets either. Absolutely. New York football will be much better off this year than if they hadn't made that trade. So that's great for them. But now over to another potential trade situation in the NFL. Um, again, coming out kind of yesterday and today over the weekend that supposedly the 49ers are are interested in shopping Trey Lance, are open to offers for Trey Lance. Um, there's a whole slew of teams that many people are projecting he could go to. You, know, you have the Jets, Texans, Broncos, Buccaneers, Rams, Titans, a bunch of teams who could use a backup, could use a guy who in a couple years could become the guy or yeah. could be the guy right now. Um, so... What do you think? Do you um, do you think this could even happen? I think it's really unlikely. I mean, the rumor is that um, San Francisco has been receiving calls on Trey Lance, and they haven't immediately hung up. Uh, they have not made any calls seeking out trades. They're just trying to see value right now. And I don't foresee their the 49ers' perceived value of him overlapping at all with other teams' perceived value of him. Yeah. My guess is that the 49ers want at least a first-round pick, preferably in this draft, and that most other teams are willing to offer, at most, an early second-round pick, um, and even then, probably not in this draft. So, um, I mean, you look at this list that we just had. The Jets are already off of it. We made this list right before the trade for Aaron Rodgers. Um the Texans, I think, would be better off taking a quarterback at 102 this year, more than likely. The Broncos are uh, somewhat tempted by this, probably, just because uh, it, it sort of acts as insurance against Russell Wilson not being able to recover while also giving them a similar archetype of player to build around. Um, but they don't have a lot of draft capital to sort of like waste on an insurance policy. Um, Buccaneers... Uh, and Titans are both decent uh, places for him to land, as is maybe the Vikings. Um, Rams, I don't think so. I, I just don't see anyone wanting to pay what I think the 49ers will require. So, in my opinion, it doesn't happen, and I, I'm not sure who it would be to if it does. Yeah. Yeah, I just don't. I mean, especially what they drafted him at four. Overall, right? They third tra- overall. Yeah, third overall. They traded so, up to take him third overall. So not traded, only did they have the use of the third overall pick, they also gave up then all the value of all the other yeah. assets. So the total assets, I believe, was their 11th overall pick, as well as two future firsts. Yeah. So that is... Uh, I was telling Evan this earlier off, uh, off camera, and um, I think that if the GM were to make this trade for anything less than a first he is welcoming being fired because you cannot just exchange what is effectively three first round picks and two years of lost time for a second round pick and keep your job. Yeah. So. Absolutely. Well, we'll see what the 49ers do. I mean, the other thing with the 49ers is that I, I don't see how it makes sense for them to do, to make this trade without knowing first what Brock where Brock Purdy stands. Yeah, Because right, right now it's still up in the air. And if he's not ready, because the 49ers are a team that regardless of who the quarterback is, they can compete for, for NFC. Now, Maybe yeah. not the Super Bowl, but like they can make playoffs. They can be competitive in the playoffs. We, they, we saw that with Brock Purdy last year. So if they can have Trey Lance there to fill in the void while Brock Purdy's out for the first couple of weeks... Absolutely, take right. that because you no longer have Jimmy G sitting there anymore. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm not. I'm not really sure. I see it happening um, unless the Titans or the Bucks 
or the Rams were willing to just shell out for him, and maybe then the 49ers would bite the bullet for the first couple of weeks without Brock Purdy. Right. But, yeah, the Broncos aren't going to spend a lot for an insurance plan. I mean, they would be, they would be trying to get Trey for the least amount of value that the 49ers are willing to give him up for. Right. So... Enough of trades now. Over to our mock situation here. So again, we're going to be doing the first 16 picks of the first round. The way we're going to do it is that we're going to be alternating picks. Jonathan will take the odd numbers, so one, three, five, so on and so forth. I will be taking evens. Um, we will not be doing mock trades in this, so we will be doing the top 16 picks as they are now, including the Jets and Packers pips pick swap. So Packers will be at 13, Jets at 15. Um, but we're just going to go through here and list off who we believe teams should take. Not who we think they will, but who we think they should take. Yeah. So we're, we're going from a very general manager mindset here is, is the goal. So with that being said, um, the Carolina Panthers are now on the clock. And Jonathan, who do you have the Panthers taking at the 101 of the 2023 NFL Draft? Uh, yeah. Do we want to read this out like it's draft picks? Sure, if you'd like. Make it fun. <laughs> All right. With the first overall pick in the 2023 NFL Draft, the Carolina Panthers will be selecting C.J. Stroud. I mean, we all know it's going to be a quarterback here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you don't trade as many assets as the Panthers did to move up and not take a quarterback. Um, the question really is between Bryce Young and C.J. Stroud, if you're a reasonable person. Um, and in my opinion, the best quarterback in this class is C.J. Stroud. He does lack a little bit of mobility that Bryce Young has. Um, he's decent enough to hold his own on designed runs, but you shouldn't expect him to scramble. He's He, he loses a decent amount of accuracy when throwing on the run, but uh, he just has the best ball placement I've seen um, since Trevor Lawrence and before him, maybe since Andrew Luck, um, just is able to hit you exactly where you need to be, sort of control the defense with his ball placement. He has a good understanding of the defense. There's a little bit of concerns with how quickly he goes through his reads, but when I watch him, he seems to have a good understanding before the snap happens of who will be open. So he sort of adjusts his reads accordingly pre-snap, um, and for my biggest strength of him, I just have, he's able to throw you open. If, if it's in tight coverage, he will throw it where only you can get it, and as long as you have decent hands, um, there won't be an interception, there will be a decent completion, um, which is really just my biggest thing in a quarterback. I couldn't ask for more. So, CJ Stroud, 101. Not sure it's going to happen, but it should. <laughs> All right, now on to pick number two, Houston Texans. And with the second pick, the Houston Texans should be taking Bryce Young, quarterback, Alabama. Um, and I actually had my bracket or my mock draft here set up the same way that Jonathan did. I had Stroud going first and Bryce Young going second. I think CJ is the better prospect in my mind, but Bryce Young is also a phenomenal prospect. I mean, very high football IQ, great athlete. Um, I'm not sure... I have ever seen someone so poised and calm in the pocket, even with pockets collapsing around him, as a college quarterback in quite a while. I mean, he just he's very mature, um, has a very good arm, but of course there are the concerns about his size. At 5'10", is what he's measured in at. That might be being a little bit generous. <laughs> I'm yeah. not sure he's quite 5'10", but he's still a good enough prospect that the Houston Texans need to shoot their shot on this. I mean... The, their hope is that next year they won't be in this high of a pick again. And if that's the case, they're not going to have another shot at this high end of a quarterback prospect. Right. I think Bryce has tons of potential. Yes, he also has bust potential, but his ceiling is incredibly high. He is worth the risk, especially for a Texans team who is pretty much already hit bottom. So what does it matter if they bust on a guy? <laughs> um, it is worth the shot. Bryce Young to the Houston Texans. 
All right. Yeah, I don't disagree. Um, I, I think that it's more likely that Stroud is available here than Young. Yeah. In which case, it's a no-brainer for me. But um, they need to take their shot at a quarterback while they have this good of a talent available to them. Absolutely. But now, on to the third overall pick, currently owned by the Arizona Cardinals. And with this pick in the 2023 NBA NFL draft... <laughs> um, the Arizona Cardinals will be selecting Will Anderson Jr. Um, this is, in my opinion, the best edge rusher in the class. He is a speed rusher, a very versatile defender as well, um, able to drop back into coverage when he needs to, um, able to get to the quarterback, able to... Uh, he, he's aware enough that on run plays, even though he's more of a finesse guy than a power guy... He's able to track the ball and make the right reads so that he covers up the correct hole. Um, but just a uh, just buttery hand slips through anyone and excellent awareness of the play as a whole. Um, I, I labeled him his best strength as disruptor. He just always seems to find a way to be in the way. And that's just an invaluable skill. Um, he will get a lot of showy, show, uh, big sacks and stuff, but he will also just affect every play. Yeah, absolutely. For, through our first three picks, so far we completely agree with each other. I also had Will Anderson in mind. Um, and I think for the Cardinals, it's him and Jalen Carter are probably pretty close to each other. Jalen Carter is also phenomenal. But Will Anderson is, like, one of the nicest guys off the field. And for an organization that's yeah. had – a lot of bad stuff happened over the past year. I think taking a guy who you know is just going to be... I mean, he's kind of a surefire thing on and off the field. So, yeah, absolutely. Good pick. Now to the Indianapolis Colts at four. And with the fourth overall pick, I have the Indianapolis Colts taking Anthony Richardson, quarterback, Florida. And uh, Jonathan just grimaced next to me here. He is not, <laughs> he is not an Anthony Richardson guy. And for me, this may not even be more really about the fact that I am an Anthony Richardson guy as it just is that the Colts like they have to figure out their quarterback situation pretty much for the Colts at this point there's no one available on the free agency market it's either go get Lamar Jackson from the Ravens or draft a rookie quarterback and with Stroud and Young more than likely already being gone in the first two and really no matter how you mock it up Anthony Richardson is the way to go and and Watching Anthony Richardson, yes, he is very, very raw, but he is also a freak of an athlete and has a very, very high ceiling, great arm. He's pretty accurate. Other thing that I kind of like to point out is that he did go to Florida. He didn't have the luxury of the weapons that Bryce Young and C.J. Stroud did at Ohio State and Alabama, so he not throw into the same level of talent um but I, so i think anthony richardson to the colts makes a lot of sense colts we may see trade out of this spot if stroud and young are gone uh, and one of them doesn't fall to them but we'll we'll see for now i have Colts yeah. taking richardson yeah i mean richardson i think is a high upside pick um he's just not a guy that i fully believe in um and like like we said earlier we aren't doing trades this draft if we were I probably would have had the Ravens picking here because I don't see a good reason that the Colts should hold on to the 104 when it's more than likely enough to acquire Lamar Jackson. Yeah. Um, and the quarterback class, I really see two guys as first round values. It's CJ Stroud, who I am happy to take 101, and it's Bryce Young, who frankly, preferably, I'd probably take between the fifth and tenth overall pick but you pay a little bit more for a quarterback in this league. Um, I don't see Anthony Richardson, Will Levis, or any of these guys being first-round values in my mind. A lot of them have decent upside, but I don't see them attaining that upside, and I don't see their talent to be able to survive very well in their first year either. But it's not an unreasonable pick year. Um, Now, where we are going to immediately differ here, you (laughs) talked a little bit about how um, Jalen Carter is your second favorite edge rusher. I (laughs) have my second favorite edge rusher going to the Seattle Seahawks at fifth overall, and he is Tyree Wilson. 
He's a, a much different archetype than Will Anderson, but he is a power rusher, um, an excellent run defender who was able to sort of contain both the edge and the B-gap just based on his size and his strength. Um, he's able to disrupt the quarterback uh, when he is, uh, like, I, I have it here that um, when the pass is certain, he disrupts the quarterback because he also has a shockingly good awareness of the play and a little bit of a conservative approach. So while there are options open, he sort of takes his man head on, pushes him back towards the ball, and then leaves open the option to break to either side to cover the run or the pass. But as soon as the running back leaves uh, the backfield, he throws his guy down and gets to the quarterback. He is just a very strong, very great guy who, uh, again, to uh, sort of cover my uh, my top strength for him, I called him an option stuffer. He will just take up the A and B gap, on, or the, sorry, the B and C gap on his side, and he will also take away any option to scramble to that side as a quarterback and if you take too long in the pocket, he'll get you too. So just an excellent option stuffer at the uh, defensive end position. Yeah. And I, I had Jalen Carter in mind going to the Seahawks, but I don't I don't hate that big at all. Tyree Wilson is phenomenal. I mean, really any of all those three guys, you can kind of put them in any order. It really just depends on what teams value most at the edge position. So it'll, it'll so. be easy to steer, interesting to see how it shakes out in the draft because um, – Seahawks and Cardinals, if they stay in those spots, absolutely need an edge rusher. And then later in the draft, we, of course, have other teams that desperately need need the edge position. We're now over to the Detroit Lions. And with the sixth pet pick in the draft, I had the Detroit Lions taking Christian Gonzalez, cornerback, Oregon. Um, the Lions in 2022 had the worst-ranked defense in the NFL with a 31st-ranked pass coverage this is a team and i have on my team needs you know every team i have listed position for team needs on the lions i literally just put defense um they need defense everywhere but i think at this point based on who's already gone um going cornerback cornerback makes sense and i think christian gonzalez is a great pick here um i have him as my favorite corner in the draft i think he's amazing um the best skill i saw from him just watching him and reading stuff is he does a thin fantastic job of using the sidelines as an extra defender in coverage which is a huge skill for corners to learn and for a lot of corners that's like a veteran skill that you learn down the line and once you're developed and he already has it coming out of college um so he would be a guy that the lions could plug in and instantly would make their pass coverage better obviously they need to get other guys as Mm -hmm. well but he would help out and be able to you know, defend the other team's wide receiver once and take on that assignment. So, yeah, I got Christian Gonzalez. Yeah, I think that Christian Gonzalez is also my favorite corner. He's a uh, he, something that I have for him is he's great at setting traps as well. I think that he's primarily a like cover one cornerback, mm-hmm. uh, really good at man defense. But when he's put into a zone, he's really good at sort of like faking like he's in man on coverage uh and then jumping a route uh, you see like a lot of his interceptions in college sort of come from him like fading towards one defender and then jumping on another or fading towards one receiver jumping on another so um he's going to make a couple of really electric plays and when he's not making electric plays he'll just shut a guy down yeah which you can't ask for anything better um but now it's on to the Las Vegas Raiders, um, picking fifth overall, seventh overall, seventh overall, <laughs> seventh overall. <laughs> and with the seventh overall pick, the Vegas Raiders are probably pretty excited that Jalen Carter is still on the board. But you he won't are, be any longer. God, you are destroying my entire game. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jalen Carter, I have as another power rusher, but. Uh, he is able to play both on the interior of the defensive line as well as the defensive end position. Um, sort of a, a guy that relies on his strength maybe more than I would prefer. Uh, he doesn't have the greatest finesse moves, uh, as I've seen, but he is. Uh, he's also a touch slow, um, which is not unexpected for a defensive tackle, but he is still able to cover multiple holes, plug options, and when he's needed, he is a hungry pass rusher. Um, there's obviously a couple of like minor character concerns that have come out recently, but 
Um, I mean, what team is better to handle those <laughs> concerns than the Raiders? So, um, just his top skill for me, relentless pass rusher, and I think that he would fit well with that squad. I like it. I didn't have that as my game plan, but it, it makes sense. I, I like that pick for the Raiders. But now over to the Falcons at 8th overall, and with the 8th overall pick, the Atlanta Falcons will be taking... Bijan Robinson running back from Texas. All right, baby. Um, I was kind of surprised when when we were setting this up. I was looking at a lot of people's mocks, and a lot of people didn't have Bijan in the top ten or even the top sixteen, for that matter. And I get it. Running backs are they're kind of weird in today's game when it comes to drafting them. But Bijan Robinson is a different kind of guy. I yeah. mean, he is as close to a surefire thing as a for a draft pick as you can get a lot of people view him as being the best offensive player outside of the quarterback position coming out of this draft um, which I think is absolutely fair yeah and for the Falcons who really just need to build up their offense yes they need a quarterback but at this point in time um, three quarterbacks will have already been off the board in our mock and I don't see them wanting to go with Levis so I think they go for the best offensive weapon available and Bijan Robinson would immediately make their offense much more explosive. You pair him next to Drake London and Kyle Pitts and you have a recipe there that is hopefully setting up Desmond Ritter for success in Atlanta. So I have Atlanta taking Bijan. I love that pick. I love Bijan. He is he's one of the uh like for such an incredible, powerful, quick um running back he also impressively hits the hole with just such quick speed and decision making like i really don't have a major complaint about him the only real question mark for him going into the draft in my mind is do nfl teams value the running back position because if they do at all he is an obvious incredible player at that position so i'm excited to see what he can do in the league um But now, over to the Chicago Bears pick uh, with the ninth overall pick in the draft. The Chicago Bears will select Darnell Wright, offensive tackle out of Tennessee. Um, This is a very strong tackle, um, not a very quick tackle, but his big advantage is he is just the most technically sound tackle that we have seen in a long time. Just excellent hand technique. Super intelligent, excellent in zone defense or zone uh, blocking schemes. Um, he, he's able to like mix up the defender, which is sort of something that you sort of view the other way around in most cases. Um, you see the defender trying to like go low one time, go around, sp- hit him with the spin move, but um, Darnell Wright is just able to respond with um, like proper hand checking, proper. Um, he is just an incredibly technically proficient and smart tackle that I don't think will struggle on run blocking or pass blocking um, in the slightest. Um, just a very safe prospect who I think will deliver great success to his team. I like it. Once again, it's it's you screwing up my bracket rather than me screwing up yours, but that's okay. <laughs> and now with the 10th overall pick... Um, I will have the Philadelphia Eagles taking Miles Murphy, edge from Clemson. Um, Eagles are in an interesting position. They did lose a lot of defensive players to free agency and stuff over this offseason, but their defensive unit is still pretty stacked. Um, So I kind of have them more or less making a pick for the future here. Um, Kind of their two edge players. You have Derek Barnett, whose contract is up in 2024, and then Brandon Graham, who's getting older, is old for an edge for sure. So I think Miles Murphy would make a lot of sense for him here. I think at this point, this is probably the most talented defensive guy left on my board, at least. I think Um, so. I really like him. He's got great athleticism, very fast, um, quick steps, quick feet, so... Miles Murphy to the Eagles. All right. Uh, now on to the 11th overall pick for the Tennessee Titans. And I think I'm going to surprise a lot of people with this pick. Um, but I'm going a wide receiver out of Boston College. That's right. Zay Flowers being the first receiver off the board. 
Um, he just runs buttery smooth routes. He's excellent in open space. Complete route tree. That's my, that's my main strength for him is just he can do any route uh, so smoothly. Uh, he'll make athletic catches. He's not the best at um, creating artificial space by positioning his defender, but that's sort of a, uh, a rare skill that I see amongst receivers, and not a lot of receivers in this class, I think, have it. Um, but he will he'll catch any undeflected ball near him, and he will be open more often than he won't be. So I think that this is just the perfect complement to go alongside Traylon Burks. Uh, and partially why I have him going here instead of uh, Smith Najigba is just because I think this is a better complement for this offense. Um, I think my rankings for the players themselves might come out slightly differently, but Tennessee would be very happy to get a route runner like Zay Flowers. I'll be crazy <laughs> if they go wide receiver, um, but we'll, we'll see. I have them taking O-line, but... O line's an option too. Yeah. I just no, I see they, them wanting to fill out fill out the offense a little bit more um, at skill positions right now. They gave up a lot when they gave up um, AJ Brown, and for sure, um, I think that this is a great way to find immediate success there. All right, but that now leaves for the Houston Texans um, at pick number twelve. I'm now going to have them taking Jackson Smith and Jigba from Ohio State wide receiver. All right. Um, I, in my mock, I actually had the Bears taking him to kind of pair alongside Justin Fields. Um, the Bears wide receiver room, notoriously bad. Even they've made some moves, but they could always use help in that area. But now the Houston Texans, um, I don't think they would be upset at all to pair whatever quarterback they drafted with a young wide receiver who they can have grow to and develop together, especially a guy like Jackson Smith and Jigba. And we were talking earlier again off off mic that and Jigba's weird because it's not that he's necessarily exceptional at really any area, but he's very good at everything. Yeah. And so which then leads to him being such a good wide receiver. I mean he's not gonna blow you away with his speed, his size, his athleticism, but they're all they are all the, they're, well above average. Yeah, they're all well above average, <laughs> and he's well above average route runner, uh, well above average at shaking off his defender, well above average hands. I mean, he's yeah. just a very, very good wide receiver. <clears throat> just no weaknesses, yeah. really. And That's in this instance, um, based on our mock, we would then be pairing Bryce Young with him, which I think would work out pretty darn well for the Texans, especially for the Texans. Um, they lost essentially their main wide receiver, Brandon Cooks, to free agency. So they are in desperate need of a wide receiver if they're going to bring in a young quarterback. Um, I had them taking Zay Flowers, but since you already took him, Jackson Smith and Jigba to the Texans. All right. I like to see it. All right. So we have a trade to announce <laughs> because it's already happened. We didn't mock this. Uh, the Green Bay Packers have moved up to the 13th overall pick in the draft, swapping with the Jets. And um, with this pick, I was I was slightly tempted actually to go offensive tackle because I think there are a lot of strong OTs in this uh, in this draft. And um, while it's not the biggest need for the Packers, they would benefit from it. Rather though, I am going to go with tight end out of Notre Dame, Michael Meyer. Um, he is. Let me find my notes on him since I'm unprepared. Um, he is an every down tight end, which is so huge in this game because he is an excellent run blocker, a solid pass blocker, and also just has a really decent um, catch radius and um, is um, he's really good on reach catches. He's really good at um, getting up for passes as well. So if you th if you uh, sort of throw him open vertically, he'll be able to get the ball um, and just he will be on the field every single play of the game because of his versatility at the tight end position. Um, whereas a lot of these other players, like I also obviously um, thought about Kincaid here um, at the tight end position, but I think that Kincaid is slightly less complete of a player. And while he might be better for fantasy, um, I'm not certain necessarily where they fall in fantasy for me. I think that Michael Meyer is the better real world tight end here. 
I would love that as a Packers fan. That would make me happy. Yeah. Um, now over to the Patriots, though, with the 14th overall pick. And I'm going to have the Patriots taking Paris Johnson Jr. tackle out of Ohio State. Um, the Patriots, as a run-heavy offense, their O-line is a big deal for them. Um, and they now have a massive hole at left tackle and could immediately slot Paris Johnson in there. And you look at his strengths as a player, one of his biggest strengths is his ability to block for the run. And as a team with Ramondre Stevenson and now James Robinson, a team who is going to be running the ball a lot because they still had Mac Jones, who is decent as a quarterback, but isn't really a volume passer. Um, I think it makes the most sense for the Patriots to go ahead here and address their need at left tackle and take Paris Johnson. Yeah, I think that's a good pick. Um, the the top four tackles in this class are pretty contested yep. as to who fits where. Um, and this might be the best landing spot for Paris Johnson just based on his archetype. Um, I, I almost might lean uh, slightly towards Broderick Jones here, but he's a lot more raw of a prospect, really a, a future hope that he'll be able to develop into something based on his strength and athleticism, whereas Paris Johnson is a more sure thing and also fits their scheme fairly well. So I do like that pick. Um, but now uh, the Jets have moved back to the 15th overall pick, and they are going to take an offensive tackle as well, but neither of the guys that I just mentioned. <laughs> they are fairly happy to see Peter Skoronsky still on the board. Yeah. Um, which is kind of funny because I have him as like a lot of teams' favorite tackles, and I also feel like he will fall this far just because um, a lot of those teams have other needs that they're going to take over Skoronsky. And... Um, Skaronsky also has a couple of concerns. He has uh, sort of short arms for a tackle, uh, which is a surprisingly big deal. Um, there's a lot of hand fighting on the on the line, and he will struggle a little bit with that. But he's also just incredibly fast with his legs, um, excellent in zone blocking schemes, always able to position himself well relative to his defender, and just in any zone run blocking scheme, which the Jets run a lot, mm -hmm. um, he will be really good at run blocking. The question mark is, how well will he do pass blocking? Because he tends to get a little bit too vertically, and um, he can be pushed back a little bit into his quarterback, especially against a power rusher. But I think that he should hopefully be able to develop in that aspect, and he'll prove himself enough of an asset in other regards to be worthy of this pick. All right, and now for the last pick of our mock here, the Washington Commanders at pick number 16, and I will have them taking... Devon Witherspoon, cornerback, Illinois. And I am sure the commanders would be ecstatic <laughs> to see Devon fall this far. Um, yeah. The race for the best cornerback in the draft, it's between him and, and Christian Gonzalez, but it's a very tight race. I mean, you, you go through mocks and it's 50-50 split on who people view as better. Um, the commanders, um, of course, as per usual, have a lot of needs, but their secondary is definitely one of the biggest ones. Um, they had one of the... It, it, their past defense last year was mediocre, um, but if they're wanting to contend anytime soon, it needs to get significantly better. And I think sitting here with Devon Witherspoon available, it, he's just the type of guy that you can't really pass up if you need a corner at all. Yeah. So Devon Witherspoon to the commanders. Yeah, he's a, he's a very interesting prospect. Um, huge hitter, makes some really yeah. exciting plays. Um, he's a touch handsy in man coverage, but uh, uh, with the way that NFL has been called in recent years, he hopefully won't get into too much trouble with hand checking. Um, and then I think that he's just an excellent zone defender. He yeah. sort of plays a lot to his strengths. He's able to respond quickly to plays. Um, so I, I think that he's a great pick here. The commanders would be really happy to add him to their secondary. Yeah, absolutely. Well... So so, uh, just to interrupt here, we only had the first 16 picks planned, but Evan, um, what picks do you think surprised you the most? And also, who is still left on the board that you think um, maybe shouldn't be or has a, at least a chance to go earlier? Yeah. Um, 
Well, your pick of uh, Darnell Wright definitely surprised me with the Bears. Um, yeah. I was taking Jackson, Smith, and Jigba there. Um, Zay Flowers to the Titans. I actually had Peter Skaronsky there going to the Titans because the Titans are in desperate need of some offensive line help. But outside of that, I mean, everything, I think we lined up pretty well. Um, my top guys that were left that we didn't talk about were Dewan Jones, um, okay. Osiris Torrance, yeah, and then um, Joey Porter Jr., who is kind of the third cornerback there on the list. And then there's, of course, the elephant in the room of Will Levis, so I don't think either of us are expecting to go in the top 16, but you right. get, he's he was on my board still because just in case you went batshit crazy with yours, <laughs> I had to have him there just in case. But um, he will definitely be a guy to watch in the draft to see where he ends up because, I mean, honestly, I could see him anywhere between top 10 if team gets teams get desperate enough to sit in the green room until the end of day two. So. Right. Very cool, yeah. I mean, frankly, I'm I'm not sure I was surprised by a lot. I, I don't think I would have gone Anderson to the Colts, um, but I also would probably prefer to trade that pick if I were them over almost anything I else. I mean, Rich, Richardson to the Colts. Uh, yeah, Richardson yeah. to the Colts. Uh, I would probably, if they had to stay, I would probably take Wilson, uh, Tyree Wilson there. But um, for the most part, I don't think much surprised me about this draft after having prepared. And um, I think maybe the 16 best players... Uh, in my opinion, uh, other than Anderson, uh, uh, Richardson, gosh dang it, um, <laughs> other than Richardson, um, the six, the 15 best players went in the top 16. So I think that this would be a pretty good draft for all teams involved. Yeah, absolutely. And again, like you said, the Colts at number four will be an interesting one to watch out for for potential trade. Um, Cardinals, of course, will be an interesting one. There are going to be plenty of teams who want to try and jump the Colts to potentially take a quarterback, especially if you wind up seeing Stroud or Young. They're still sitting available at number three. Um, the Falcons, you know, Lions maybe, the Raiders maybe, plenty of teams who might try and jump and, and grab a guy there. So the Cardinals will be an interesting one. But outside of that, I'm not sure there's going to be a whole lot of trades in this one. I mean, there's just, yeah. there's a lot of talent here at the top of this draft, especially defensive talent, and it just so happens that there's a lot of teams that need defensive players. So. Right. <laughs> I mean, the only teams that I really see possibly trading are three through five, the Cardinals, the Colts, or the Seahawks. Yeah. And that all depends on what quarterbacks are still available, and it also depends on do they want one of these star edge rushers because those are hard to come by. And it might be worth sticking around. Even if you can get a haul for someone looking for a quarterback, you might still stay so that you can grab one of these top edge rushers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Anderson, Wilson, and Carter are all right there. Yeah. So, very competitive spots. That is enough of our mockery of the draft here <laughs> now pass over to our weekly betting segment 100 units and 10,000 to 1 um, interesting week because we can bet on the NFL draft which is always a grand old time um, and then you got NBA postseason NHL postseason MLB everything in full swing so Jonathan what are your 100 units bets of this week yeah I'm doing a couple because you only get to bet the draft once a year <laughs> so um, I'm doing mostly positions and uh, how many will be drafted in the first round. So I've got under four and a half quarterbacks. This is something that I think 100% should happen, and I really hope it does. <laughs> uh, but it's plus 128. Uh, I'm going to put half a unit on that. Um, then the, I, there's a three and a half wide receivers in the first round. I'm going over on that number. Um, I'm not sure who the fourth wide receiver would be, but it's a deep enough class that I think a late round pick is certainly justified. And um, that one's minus 106. I'll go half a unit again. Then we have uh, five and a half defensive backs. I'm going under um, at plus 140 for the under. It is um, just not quite um, deep enough, I think, to justify six defensive backs going in the first round. There's a lot of pretty solid corner depth at the top, but not a lot of safeties that I'd really strongly consider in the first round, and I think that 5.5 is a fairly safe under bet, especially for plus odds. 
only a quarter of a unit on that one, though, since I'm slightly less familiar with the defensive backs. Um, and then 22 and a half as the draft position for Zay Flowers. I'm going under for that. Mm. I had him going at, um, where did I have him going? You had him going uh, 11th? Yeah, 11. Um, and I think that uh, he should go at least uh, before 22nd, which would see me getting plus 140 odds on half a unit. So those are my draft bets, um, at least my ones that fit the 100 <laughs> units category. But, Evan, what have you got? Um, I didn't go as crazy as you did on draft bets, but who knows? There's there's still time here. Maybe I'll find <laughs> myself wandering around on FanDuel a little bit. Um, my main ones, I have C.J. Stroud going number one overall at plus 1,500. Put a quarter of a unit on that. Um, I very strongly believe that C.J. Stroud should be the number one overall pick. Whether that happens or not, we'll see. But I'll take the 1,500 odds on that one since I believe in it so much. Um I also just put one down on, where is it? Where did it go? On running backs. They set the line at one and a half running backs in the first round, and I'm taking the over on that. Mm. Um, obviously, I believe, believe in Bijan. He's oh, yeah. <laughs> by far and away the best running back. He'll go in the first. Uh, but there's also behind him, there's two or three more running backs who I think have first round potential. There are plenty of teams who need running backs right now. Um, so I could see some other team probably towards the end of the first round. You know, somewhere in the 20s or maybe the 30s, 31st or 32nd pick, taking a second running back. Um, but I like those odds. Um, that one comes in at minus 130, so not getting a lot from it, but take it to put a quarter of a unit down on that one. And then my last one, just to be different, I made an NHL bet. Um, I picked the Lightning and Avalanche money line in a parlay, which gives me plus 225 odds, and I put a quarter of a unit down on that one. Very nice, yeah. I mean, for the... Um for the running backs one, I think that that's really mostly a bet on will Jamar Gibbs go in the first round. And yeah. <laughs> I think that it's a good enough chance to probably put that down. Um, it's a little bit risky, but I do like that bet as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, onto the 10,000 to 1 bets. And for me, I'm going once again with Zay Flowers um, just because you're not able to parlay draft bets for oh, yeah. some reason. <laughs> um, so I'm getting as close as I can in a single bet that makes sense to me. And that is Zay Flowers going in the top 10 picks. That's plus 5,000 odds. And I can get a quarter of a unit on that uh, to pay me out pretty well. And I, I think that more likely is he goes 11, which will suck for me. But <laughs> um, I wasn't able to bet that either. So uh, Zay Flowers going top 10 for plus 5,000. I like it. All right. Over to mine. Um, I did my standard NBA same game parlay bullshittery. Um, I did it on the Bucks and Heat game. I took Heat money line, Jimmy Buckets to have 25 points, Chris Middleton to have 25, Bam to have 15, Brooke to have 15. Um, and then it allowed me to do another Chris Middleton alt points where I did over 22.5 on him since I already bet 25. And then Drew Holiday, I picked over 17.5. Currently halftime at the game as we're doing this right now, and the bet's not looking too phenomenal, but it's how these usually go for me, so it's okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, I love it. Well, I think that's all the time that we have for today. Um, thank you all for tuning in, and uh, Evan, you have any hot take to send us out? Will Levis will be taken in the top ten because teams are desperate. Oh, boy. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night.